Thanks for joining us. My name is Sylvia Bruner and I'm the director here at the Jim Gatchell Memorial Museum. And I am tickled to death to be asking uh, fan favorite questions of Craig Johnson. Hi, I'm Craig Johnson. I'm the author of the Longmire Mystery Series. And uh, one of the things that Sylvia did not mention is, is the Jim Gatchell Museum happens to reside in the old Carnegie Library here in Buffalo, Wyoming, which happens to be Walt Longmire's office. This is, uh, it, it's her museum, like, but it, it's my sheriff's office. Like, and so um, <laughs> it's a wonderful opportunity to be here. It's a, and we're, we happen to be right here within the, the Walt Longmire exhibit. Um, which has been on display for the better part of a year now, yeah, hasn't it? Yeah, over a year. Yeah, now, over yeah. a year. Like, and so uh, we're pretty excited about that. Like, a, you don't get too much of an opportunity um, to have a, a, an illustrious you know, group like the Jim Gatchell do something as magnificent as this, you know, on your behalf. And so the first thing I'd like to do is say thank you. Oh well, thank you, and you're very welcome. We're happy to. We were really happy actually to install this exhibit and feature you as our local connection to this national TV show and book <laughs> series and we had a lot of fun with this exhibit. Thank you. Well, my pleasure. Absolutely my pleasure. Okay. And you forgive me for all of those people that keep coming and trying to take pictures of your office? Yes. You? Okay, good. Absolutely. Okay. Um, that actually ties into one of our first questions because... <laughs> oh, no! Because of... Uh, the Carnegie Library building being kind of the setting of the Sheriff's Office in the book series, we do, we get people that they pop in usually to my office and they kind of look around and they know they're thinking, you don't look like Walt. <laughs> <laughs> yep, not Walt. <laughs> but it always is a fun opportunity to start conversation. Mm -hmm. So one of our questions for you was kind of why did you choose the Carnegie Library building as the setting for the sheriff's office. You know, there, there were a couple of things that were just pretty factual, like that one was um, Larry Kirkpatrick, who had been the sheriff you know, here in Johnson County for a number of years. Um, when I first started working on the cold dish, he was kind of my go-to guy. Um, he was the sheriff at that point in time, like that, and so I got an awful lot of my information from him. And he happened to mention that um, the old library, you know, being located right behind you know, the courthouse, um, had actually been used by the sheriff's department as an office um, for a brief period of time, you know, before, you know, when it was a brief period of time between when the new library had been built um, and they had built, you know, a, a law enforcement center on, on a Fort Street. And so it was an actuality. It actually had been used by the sheriff's department. But for me, um, it was an aesthetic. You know, for me, a lot of it was that I really didn't want Walt Longmire to be, you know, sitting in, you know, a modern, you know, sheriff's department. It just right. didn't make sense. I mean, he's kind of old school. Right. And so he would have been, you know, really slow in giving up the old office that say Lucian Connolly had had or Red Angus, the sheriff before him, had had, you know, or Nate Champion, for goodness sake, had had like that. And so uh, I just thought there would be a lot warmer, you know, kind of environment, you know, for the sheriff to be in. Um, and give me much more of an opportunity you know, to, to do something a little bit different than what was you know, probably going to be um, expected, you know, for it to be a very modern, sterile, you know, technologically advanced kind of building. Like the one that they had the up the road. Yeah. Right. No, I, I fully agree after reading all of the books. I think that that environment wouldn't fit Walt, and that kind of endears me to him a little more because I feel the same way about our old building. It's, it's a maintenance nightmare, but we absolutely love it. <laughs> so, well, and there's so few and far between. A lot of these little Carnegie yeah. libraries, you know, have been uh, annihilated or destroyed, yes. like that, you know, because you know the the the, the, the accessibility of our technology and all that kind of stuff. It makes it a little bit difficult. Also, um, one of the difficulties is is the <coughs> geographic location of where they are. Like, and I know that when they were filming in Las Vegas, New Mexico, for the television show, there was an old Carnegie library, like that, but it was kind of like in a strange part of town with fields all around it and everything, and so it didn't fit the narrative right. of the books like that because, you know, it's right behind the, you know, the courthouse. And, uh, and, and it's really kind of a wonderful thing for me because whenever I travel around doing book events at libraries all over the country, it's kind of fun for me like that because every time I walk into an old Carnegie library, I'm like, I feel at home. You can feel it. it. Yeah. You can tell when you're oh, in yeah. Carnegie I library. feel like I'm in Walt's office every time. Nice. <laughs> so Craig, a question that I think a lot of your readers have is how do you come up with your plots? And I especially want to know, 
how do you come up with your plots that go from one book to the next to the next? How do you string that together? <laughs> you know, but there, there, there are a couple of different things. Like a, the stringing them together part is, is not all that difficult simply because, you know, as soon as you get one book done, you're starting on another. And uh, it's always a little schizophrenic also like that because whenever you're out touring for one book, your mind is on the next book the year later like that. So there, there really is a kind of a flow you know, to all of these things. So that's not too hard to kind of keep control of like that. But um, the other aspects of it, you know, as far as like where the ideas originate and all of that, um, there, there are a couple of other qualifications, you know, in the sense that, you know, I write the books in a seasonal pattern, what I refer to as a Vivaldi. You know, and it takes me four books to get through one year of Walt's life to kind of slow his aging process down like that. And then also, you know, to allow continuity, like that, that I think is kind of important to the process in the books. You know, we kind of see Walt go from one book to the next, and whatever happened to Walt in the previous book is going to, you know, be resonating in him Still, in, the, right. in that next book. Like that. Um, and then the other one, obviously by doing that, what that means is that each book is going to have a different um, environment. Um, because you know, July in Wyoming is nothing like January in Wyoming. Like it, and so enough. that you know kind of helps along you know with the, with the process of making like a different environment for each book, which was a, a piece of advice that Tony Hillerman gave me. Um, the other big question is always going to be you know well, where are the characters in their lives right now? I mean Walt obviously I need to know you know where he is and what's going on with him um, and what kind of an effect you know this this is. Uh, you know, that this particular story that I'm going to write about, what kind of effect it's going to have on Walt, or on Vic, or on Henry, or on the dog, or, you know, who knows? Like, on every one of the characters, that big question pops up. Um, and then the actual storylines are just so easy because I hear them every day. Um, everybody I talk to, every newspaper I read, you know, every conversation I have, you know, over at Ace Hardware, or down the sports lure or whatever, like and I'll overhear something or somebody will tell me a story about something and they'll say, oh, so-and-so knows the story about that. And I'm not bashful about good stories. I'll call people up and ask them questions or stop them in the streets. Like that. And the nice thing about it is also though that you know, with you know, doing what it is that I do for a living, people come to you with stories. You know, they come to you and say, hey, you know, I've got this story about such and such, do you want to hear about it? And nine times out of 10, I do. Very nice, that makes sense. So, kind of tying into what you mentioned, especially when you're on tour, um, does writing energize you or does it exhaust you or everything all at once? Oh, you know, you know, I mean, there are always going to be some times, you know, when it's difficult, like that, you know, when anything that you're doing, you know, can kind of fight you and be a little bit difficult. But I've been extraordinarily fortunate, you know, in what it is that I do and, and the way that I approach it. Um, I, I never really have approached it as a job or a chore. You know, for me, it's a joy, you know, to be able to do what it is that I do for a living. Um, and to, to be able to, like, have, you know, people that, you know, wait, you know, for the next installment, you know, of, of what it is that I do, that's really kind of wonderful. Um, and, and for me, that, that you know, it, it's become almost like, you know, breathing or eating or drinking or anything like that. You know, it's, it's kind of important to me to survive. Um, I, I shudder to think what I would be like wandering the streets of Ucross if I didn't have <laughs> books to write. Like a, that, that would be a grim proposition, you know. So it's probably good that things are the way that they are, and I do have something that kind of, you know, it, it keeps my mind busy, you know, on a full time basis. You know, even when I'm not writing, I'm thinking about the writing. Do you feel like you always have? Walt and Vic and these characters, are they kind of with you in your daily life almost? Yeah, they, they pretty much are. I mean, you know, I, I you know, you know, take bits and pieces and cherry pick, you know, from all these different people that I know. I mean, my favorite quote about that is the one from Wallace Stegner where he says, the greatest piece of fiction is the disclaimer at the beginning of every book that says <laughs> nobody in this book is based off anybody alive or dead. And what a crock that is, you know, because that's your job to go find interesting piece of people and, you know, and interesting parts of people and put them, you know, in the characters and make the character that you need to tell the story you want to tell. Um, but, you know, my wife Judy has a pretty good remark about it too. She says, in the final analysis, you're the only one in the room. You know, and so you really are. Like that. You know, whenever you're sitting there in that room all by yourself typing about your imaginary friends, you, you have to be able to find, you know, some real estate for them somewhere in your head, you know, right. to be able to allow that character, you know, to be fully blown, like that, you know, to, to actually be as real as they can possibly be. And so, yeah, Henry's in my head all the time. Lucian is in my head all the time. Vic is in my head all the time, like that. And so I, I kind of carry that crowd around with me, which is, you know, a, a good way, you know, for a, you know, a schizophrenic to make a living, I guess. Like that. I would 
think so. <laughs> so, do you have a favorite novel that you think is kind of underappreciated by the world at large? Something that really resonated with you? Oh my goodness, look at that's. It's kind of a, a specific. Yeah, it's um, and, and and looking at your condition right now, it, it, the, the the thing that I always she is expecting, just so you know, um, two boys, right? Got two boys coming on the way. As of yesterday, and they're going to yes. be good readers, right? They're going to read oh, lots of books. Okay. I've been a book nerd since I was about. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think I probably was six when okay. I learned to read, and I okay. haven't got my nose out of a book since. That's, so. that's all I wanted Absolutely. to hear. Absolutely. But uh, I, I, you know, for me, like you know, it's like asking which one's your favorite child. You know, that that's always a difficult proposition. Because it, it comes down to what your tastes are, or what your mood happens to be, or whatever. Like, because I always have people ask me, they'll say, "Well, which book should I read?" You know, and I'm always like, "Well, what do you like? Do you like, you know, uh, procedurals? Do you like thrillers? Do you like humor? Do you like history? Do you like character development?" And of course, all of the books, to a certain extent, have some of that. Like, but some are going to be stronger than others. I mean, you know, if you don't, have this, if you have the same amount of the same elements in the same books every time, well then you're basically writing the same book right. over and over again. Um, the one that's coming out in September, um, the next to last stand, is a lot of humor in it. Um, it's Walt's first art heist book, you know, so it's something a little bit different from anything I've ever dealt with before, you know, but it deals with the little bighorn battlefield, um, it deals, you know, with Custer and Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse, you know, and all of these things, and mostly it deals, you know, with the Budweiser painting, right. um, the, uh, the Custer's Last Fight, like that. so there's a lot of humor in that book, like that, but uh, sometimes you don't know maybe all the details about a book until you get started on it, and then all of a sudden, you know, it becomes more humorous than you thought it was going to be, or it becomes more dark. Uh, than you suspect, you know, and so uh, it's kind of like having a child, you know, you just kind of hope for the best you and know what you're see what happens. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> true, true enough. Um, I'm excited to hear that, that it's going to have even more humor. I think the little snippets of Walt humor in particular are some of my favorites reading through the series. Um, for that reason, Junkyard Dogs is probably one of my uh -huh. favorites. But that's also a great tie into another thought regarding next to the last stand, you know, you're hitting on all of these historical figures. And we deal with that here at the museum, but in what I suspect is an easier fashion, to be perfectly honest, because it's pretty cut and dry. We can do our research, we present information, and a lot of our visitors have to kind of, you know, push it a little further mm -hmm. if they want to know more, or they make up their own minds about things. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with the ethics when you're dealing with historical figures or historical events? Well, you know, the, the, you hit the nail on the head as far as like that, that one word that's so important is truth. Um, you know, for me, that's always going to be the, the fun part of it. Also, you know, I think also the other thing that I have in common, I think, you know, with what it is that you do here at the museum, is I'm always looking for an angle. I'm always looking for a new way to see something. I mean, the amount of information that, you know, has been compiled you know, about the Battle of the Little Big Horn mm. and about the individuals who were involved with it and the mistakes that were made or, you know, whatever ethics, you know, involved, you know, with a genocide or whatever. Um, it's been done to such an extent. I mean, I, I started doing research on this book like two years ago. And so if I ever read another, you know, Custer book, it will be too soon. Like that. And I, I also have to tell you that, sure. like, you know, with all the Custer books that have been written since 18, you know, 76, um, a lot of them are not really good, okay? <laughs> and so you kind of have to Absolutely. pick and choose. Like, and what's nice, of course, is, is that we kind of hit a period in time when a lot of historical writers um, like Nathaniel Philbrick, um, James Welch, you know, all of these incredible authors that have done amazing jobs in the last you know, number of decades I have done these incredible books. Well, here I am to reap the benefits of what it is that they did, all that research that they did, all of the the effects that you know that they came across. Like, and I get to use all of that information. And you know, you're obviously going to go through that material, and you're going to weigh, you know, what seems like the honest, you know, response, what maybe is not the honest response. Um, one of the examples that I can use is, is up until most recently, it was generally concurred that you know that the, the Lakota and the Cheyenne did not disturb the body of George Armstrong Custer. They allowed him to lay there, you know, on the battlefield with his arms folded and his body and, you know, anatomy untouched. Quite poetic. It is, but not the truth. Okay, and so, <laughs> so when you find out, you know, what, you know what, what generally happened, you know, after those type of battles, like that, you know, it seemed like the information that I had 
um, pointed to another direction. Mm -hmm. okay. And so to include that information, or more importantly, to not include that information you know, in the novel um, would have been disingenuous. Okay. And so for me, that, that, that North Star of Truth, and then also trying to find that different angle of how to approach it. For me, the angle to approach it was, of course, you know, that painting. You know, that painting that hangs in every saloon, every bar all over the United States. Like, you know, and what about that you know, painting is true? What about that painting is not true? not true? And then that painting was supposedly destroyed in 1946 at Fort Bliss in Texas. Well, what if it wasn't? You know, so that's the fun part for what it is that I get to do. If I do find the painting, though, the first place I'll have it displayed will be here at the Jim Gatchel. Perfect. I'd love to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> um, I also, I really love your explanation about that because we do deal with those same types of topics in a museum setting. You know, you might have a story that's passed down about an artifact, and it might be a really great story, but you start digging into it a little bit, and you're going, well, okay, this item wasn't patented until <laughs> 10 years after the event. It was you, uh, you used that. Uh, so, you, you know, that's part of our mission and ethics is to also have that North Star and yeah, the truth. Yeah. So I really appreciate that. You gotta stuff. have that or else you get into trouble really yeah. quick. Pretty soon you're doing, you know, tabloid uh, <laughs> museum pieces and tabloid novels. And exactly. That's, there are plenty of that out there, but I don't really want to be responsible for them. So, so um, thinking we might talk a little bit about Land of Wolves and so I was you know that was the last most recently available mm -hmm. but it also just became available via paperback it did today right it did today that's pretty awesome it is it is like it um you you you, you don't really take that into consideration like that whenever you're writing books you always think about the book that you're writing right now but each one of those books is a compilation you know of information you know it's a train of information about that character and uh you know, boy, there are people out there that are going through each and every one of those books with a fine-tooth comb, and if you make a mistake and say something wrong that you had said, you know, 12 books previously, you know, you can get into trouble pretty quick. Like that. And uh, so fortunately, I've got some readers like that who are, you know, pretty, pretty assiduous in, like, you know, making sure, like, that the information is correct, you know, when they go through. Also, you know, experts on, you know, different things like firearms or mm -hmm. historical inaccuracies, like that, or things like that. Medical situations, like that, law enforcement situations, the law, all of these things like that, they're important. But, um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's one of those things where you have these, like, um, they're like a, they're like soldiers in the army that you've created that are still out there marching on, you know, years after yeah. you tucked them away on the bookshelf. Like it, and so, you know, Land of Wolves is the sixteenth book, you know, in the series. Like that, and uh, you know, fun for me, like that, that book particularly because it actually circled back around and went to the uh, the Basque aspects mm -hmm. of our community, which are always actually right around the corner here. Like that, and uh, um, for me, that's always one of the things that's really kind of interesting. Like that, because I think the Basques. You know, they kind of get sidelined in an awful lot of, of American Western history. Oh, absolutely, um, and they shouldn't be. No, it's a no. Vibrant, colorful culture. Oh, and, and we we have so few, you know, ethnicities like that, and you know, especially European mm -hmm. ethnicities to worry, you know, to, not to worry about like that, but to actually to include um, in this world of uh, that, that that we do. I mean, um, there there was one of the Michelinas that, that wrote me a wonderful uh, you know Facebook message today saying I just. Red Land of Wolves and was so excited to see all of the Basque that was in there. And then, of course, you know, once the books got translated, you know, into French and into uh, to Spanish, you know, one of the things we got to do was actually go tour the Basque regions. Like, that. and uh, what was wonderful for me was, is I was doing an event, you know, one of the bookstores there, and a, a woman got up and asked a question, and they translated it for me, and they wanted to know where it was I learned my Basque because my Basque, my written Basque, they said was perfect, and nobody ever gets the written Basque correct. I can't take credit for that. There's actually a, a professor at the University of Miami who's my, my Basque expert. And so whenever I have things to translate, I send her my pigeon Google Basque. And she goes, oh my god, no, we really have to change all of this. Like that. But um, it, it was uh, an opportunity to deal kind of with the wolf issue, mm -hmm. an opportunity to bring back you know, a lot of the Basque characters that I really um, enjoyed, to introduce some new Basque characters like that. And uh, you know, that's it's just like old home week for me to be able to circle around and bring some of those characters back. Well, I felt like that title really dove into a hot topic. I mean, anything anything regarding wolves, oh, yeah. especially in Wyoming and the West, is a potentially touchy subject, and I thought you did an excellent job oh, at you. approaching it and imparting information. Um, but I also had to wonder, too, because it's such a deep topic, how do 
did you determine, like, what did you cut? How do you, uh, how do you narrow it down and keep it into one book instead of a, you know, part two? Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if that wolf doesn't show up again someday. Like, mm -hmm. you know, so who knows? Like, part I, two. you never can tell. Like, that, you know, it's too much of an opportunity there. Like that, but uh, yeah, it's it's a hot topic issue. It's a social issue in the West. You know, that's uh, it's a cultural issue. Um, that a lot of people respond to. And I think, you know, whenever you're taking on an issue like that, the big thing is, once again, you know, to be true to, like, you know, uh, you know, when you're talking about a species like a wolf, you know, you really kind of have to be honest and treat them the way that they're, you know, that they, they really respond. You know, most generally, they're not going to be, like, waiting behind the bus stops to drag your children, you know, into the woods, you know, and, and devour them. You know, so you really have to be honest in that. You really have to be honest in the way that a community would respond if there were wolf sightings, you know, and this was a big wolf, like that, you know, that mm -hmm. um, kind of like maybe, you know, struck a, a chord, you know, within the community, like, you know, and what their response would be. I was wonderful, you know, it was wonderful. I, I got to uh, to get in touch with the large carnivore task force, you know, for game and fish, you know, and see what they had to say about these situations, you know, and how it is that a community would respond, how they would respond, you know, where, where is it? that their responsibilities for the situation would end and the responsibilities of a sheriff, you know, with a criminal situation in hand, you know, would deal with. Um, there was just a lot there to work with. There really, really was like that, but you do have to kind of pick and choose. Um, you can't really make the book a treatise, you know, uh, you have to like kind of, you know, do what you can use like that and then, you know, move the story along like that um, because there's always gonna be a story. Um, and the story of that, that little boy and his grandfather was always going to be central and core, you know, to what it is that I was going to try and tell. Like that, and uh, if you vary too far away from that, you know, you'll get a feel for it. It'll bring you back to where you need to be. So, thinking of all of the work that you've put into all of these different topics, just out of curiosity, do you keep your research papers? All of, you must accumulate. I do. A lot of information. I do, and uh, and and a lot of it is. Um, I'm, I, 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 you know, maybe I'm just a guilty party to my own disease, like that. But I'm, I'm a terrible book buyer. I mean, I love doing research on the internet because you're a you can, wonderful book. Uh, well, and that, yes, it, it, you know, a wonderful bookstore upstairs, like that. You know, really is a marvelous bookstore you guys have, like that. But and I've, I've made it part of my collection numerous times, like that. But, uh, but it, you know, for me, like that, I love doing the internet. I love you know talking with people. That's a number one. If you can find you know primary research material where you can talk to somebody, but an awful lot of the time. You know, the situations you're dealing with and also the time periods that you're dealing with, you know, you're not, you don't have somebody from the little right. bighorn that you can sit down right. and you know, discuss this with. So you have to rely on books an awful lot of the time like that. But I just love to read. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's an occupational hazard, you know, for an author like that to, to buy research books, you know. And I've got tons and tons of research books that look like someone has committed some sort of, you know, paper chicken voodoo ceremony in them because they have post-its stuck all over them because I won't dog you the pages, this won't do that. Can't do it like that, but I do bookmarks and I do the post-its and all of that information like that. And then, uh, you know, you know, uh, legal pads, you know, of notes like uh, of all of the things, you know, I'm trying to get through in this book. And then, and then also, you know, just uh, the outlinings of the books. You know, it's important, I think, to outline so you can kind of keep a chart on where it is that that book is going. Okay. I'd like to say that that makes sense, but I don't have the drive to, to do any of this, so I will, I will take your word for it. You're, 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 you're going to have a lot more other things on your hands here in, in mm. just a, a number of months. I don't doubt that at all. <laughs> busy, busy. So, this, this has been the strangest year ever, I think, on record, certainly. Mm -hmm. And I know everybody here is going to be very much looking forward to some normalcy and welcoming more people back to Johnson County. Mm -hmm. And we feel like you kind of know Johnson County and this region inside and out. Are there any places that you would recommend for your readers and viewers to check out if they plan a Wyoming vacation? Oh my Summer goodness. of 2021. There's so much. And actually, this uh, next year will be the 10th anniversary of Longmire Days. And so we have a lot of exciting pros possibilities like that are, are taking place, you know, with the virtual Longmire Days, but also may take place in the 10th anniversary because a lot of people were hoping what come to Longmire Days are going to be here next year just simply because it is our 10th anniversary and we're For so sure. excited about it. But uh, yeah, I, you know, I mean, there's a reason why I've written, you know, 17 books, two novellas and a collection of short stories and have engendered a television show about this area because this area to me is one of the most spectacular, beautiful enticing mysterious uh, areas in the world I just I just love this place I 
really, really do. And um, I can wax poetic about it, you know, on and on and on, like that, and, and talk about the, the, the different aspects, you know, of it that uh, are so near and dear to me. We're sitting in one of them now. Like if you come, you know, to, to Johnson County, if you come to Buffalo and you don't come to the Jim Gatchell Museum, you, you've missed out on something extraordinarily important. Like that, and it, it goes on and on. I mean, there's Crazy Woman Canyon. Um, there's the Cloud Peak Wilderness area, like uh, there's the, the, the Bighorn National Forest, you know, I mean, there's just so much here. You know, just wandering up and down Main Street, you know, and seeing, you know, all of that there is um, to see, you know, in Buffalo. Like, it's a, it's, it's a ghost, you know, in many ways, or almost like a, you know, a, 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 a doppelganger, you know, uh, aspect of Durant, you know, I mean, all of the things that I mentioned in Durant, the Occidental Hotel, the, the Busy Bee Cafe, like, I mean, there's so much, you know, that when you read the books that you walk in and you almost feel like you're walking into some alternative universe um, of, 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 of Walt Longmire's world. And then, you know, the fact that the newspaper actually puts out a Durant Courant, you know, the fact that like, you know, we've got, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the cold dish, you know, yogurt shop, like that we have, you know, all of these aspects, you know, that make that, that line maybe even blur just a little bit more. Like, and you can just shoot out in any direction and just see so many of the beautiful aspects of this wonderful place where we live. And, and so much of, you know, of, of who Walt Longmire is and, and the absurd of the county. Um, I could wax, like I said, philosophic about that, you know, for, for hours on end. Um, but the best thing to do is just come and see it for what it is. Agree. Absolutely mm -hmm. agree. So you've created some very strong personalities, your characters, and particularly some strong female personalities. And I think a lot of our people that are tuning in would like to know how have you been affected in your life by strong females? Who oh. are the strong females in your life? Are there any other kind? I'm really not <laughs> aware of. <laughs> that means you're surrounded in good company. Right? I am. I am. I've got a wife. I have a daughters. I have a granddaughter. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I, I just, you know, I, I, I really, I mean, I, I grew up, you know, in a very masculine society, you know, like, you know, all of the sports, you know, and jobs that I've had and everything have always been kind of masculinely oriented. Like, and so I, I have a terrible weakness, you know, for the other gender. Like, I, I just, I, I'm always curious, you know, and always, you know, uh, uh, it, it, to me, it's, it's a joy, you know, to write those characters. It really, really is like that because, you know, to me, they are, you know, so powerful like, and so incredibly intelligent. And, you know, I mean, Walt in many ways is kind of surrounded by this, you know, this pride of lionesses mm -hmm. is the way I describe it. I mean, he's got, you know, Ruby who's responsible for the day-to-day -day aspects of his life, you know, with the, the wonderful display that you have here with Walt Longmire's office, where what, what happens is the exhibit, you can actually peel off a post-it over here and write a note to Walt Longmire, like or to me, like and uh, stick it up, you know, on the door facing the same way that, you know, that Ruby leaves the, 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 the post-its on the door facings for Walt. So he has some kind of structure to his day, like that, because otherwise he really wouldn't know what he was doing right. on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, he's also got his uh, his daughter, who is kind of like an emotional anchor, you know, for him. After the death of his wife, he really needed something to kind of hold him in this world, um, because it was a distinct possibility that he could have gone on spinning off, you know, up into the Cloud Peak Wilderness area and kind of disappeared. Never come back. Yeah, never come back. Like, and so that that anchor is his daughter, you know, Katie is like an important part of his life. And then the anchor cemented itself, you know, even further when Walt had his first grandchild, Lola. And so, you know, he, he's, 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 he's set, you know, here in this, this world. He can't go skipping off into the next world, you know, quite so easily. Um, it, it goes on and on, you know, I mean, you've got Dorothy down at the Busy Bee Cafe, who's responsible for feeding Walt, because if he didn't have somebody to feed him, he'd run out of chicken pot pies, frozen pot pies on a weekend there at the jail and, and starve to death. Sure. And so, you know, for me, it, it's, it's the same kind of mirror image of what I have. Um, I have this, you know, this wonderful, you know, surrounding of lionesses, you know, that, that follow me and keep me going in the right direction. And that's really kind of a wonderful thing to have. Um, if, you, if you don't have female companionship, I think you, you've seriously missed out on one of the important aspects of life. Absolutely. <laughs> so one last question. Okay. What's a common misconception that you hear all the time about Wyoming? Huh. What people think when you're on tour? A common misconception. Uh, 
Well, the you know the the biggest thing um, that that I see over and over again, like, and it's not just you know here in the United States; it's worldwide. Um, I, I remember when my French uh, publisher was going to come for a visit, you know, here in Wyoming, and I asked him. I said, "Well, what are you planning on doing? Like, how are you planning on doing this?" And he said, "Well, we're going to fly into Seattle, and we're going to drive across to Glacier National Park, and then drop down through the western part of Montana into Yellowstone, and then we're going to see um, probably Jackson, and then we'd like to, you know, meet up with you for dinner." Um, well, no, not then. Like I said, then we're going to swing down through into Colorado, like at Rocky Mountain National Forest. Like then we're going to swing down into Bryce Canyon, into Utah, swing back around through probably uh, the Grand Canyon, swing back up through Colorado, and then meet you at your ranch for dinner, and then shoot back over to Seattle and fly back, you know, to Europe. And I said, "Well, how much time have you got for this?" And he said, "We've got a week." And I was like, "Wow, that." That's really going to be something. You know, you do reach a certain age in your life where you don't argue with people when they tell you incredible things. You just nod your head and go, really? Wow. Okay. And so uh, when, when he took off on his trip, we heard from him about maybe four days later. And he said, we're going to be in Jackson tomorrow night. Do you want to meet us for dinner there? And I was like, sure, yeah, we'll meet you there for dinner. No problem at all. I didn't ask any questions. I just, you know, went and we, we drove over, like I met them for dinner. And I still remember uh, Al Oliver getting out of the van. And he got out of the van when they pulled up. And he looks at me and he goes, this is a very big country. <laughs> and I said, yes, it is. Yes, like, it and he goes... Um, it's it's much larger when you have three children in the back seat also. And I was like, which is a good note for you to have and, and for future reference there. <laughs> but, uh, but I looked at him and I said, yeah, it, it probably is. Okay. And uh, uh, I think probably the biggest thing is, is that, you know, that you have to kind of remind people just how big the American West is. Like, you know, and, and, and Wyoming being the ninth largest state um, is, a, is a big portion of it. Um, trying to make that run, you know, from one part of Wyoming down to the other can sometimes be, you know, a little bit time consuming. And I still remember when they first started doing the television show, um, they would say things to me like, you know, they would have something in the script that would say, we're going to run down to Denver and we'll be back, you know, in, in a couple of hours. And I was like, yeah, no, you're not. No, not unless the Absaroka County, you know, Learjet is available. Or are we going to be able to do that? So I, what I did finally was send them a great big map of Wyoming. And it had a, a pin, you know, right in the middle of, of Buffalo, and then a string, you know, with another pin on the end, and then I would put a mark, you know, in a, in a marker with a, an hour for every <laughs> distance that they were going to have to go. Like, and so, sorry, I was trying to, yeah, I, I, I'm not sick, I just have a, a cough. Sorry, I was just starting to laugh there. I apologize. <laughs> I, can, I can absolutely understand that. We deal with that a lot with our visitors here at the museum. Ask, well, what do I do next? Like I've made it to Buffalo and I'm moving, they're going north or wherever, and they say, where do I go next? Okay, go visit the Battle of Little Bighorn. Uh -huh. Oh, okay. That'll take us like, what, 15 minutes? And I always think, <laughs> well, if you made it to Buffalo, you came here from somewhere, and we're in the middle of nowhere. So right, right. Like, you just gotta start planning for these very long. Yeah, yeah. You have plenty of fuel. Plenty Modern of water. travel is a lot faster than, like, you know, than it was maybe in 1876. Like, but nonetheless, it still takes a while to drive to get from one spot to the it other. Is substantial. So the big thing is, is that I would always tell people, like, and always make sure you have enough time. That's the big thing. I mean, you know, you, you really shouldn't be racing, you know, from no. one spot to the next. I think you really need time to actually stop once in a while and just look yeah. and listen and, and appreciate the wide open spaces, oh, yeah. especially if you can get some sunrises and sunsets. Oh, in or you're racing the, you know, the pronghorn antelope, you know, as you're going down the highway and noticing that the, high, the pronghorn antelope are keeping up <laughs> um, with your car. Like an, or, you know, making the dodge, you know, over to, you know, to Cody. And uh, there in the valley, you know, seeing a mother grizzly bear with her two cubs. Like, I mean, you got to keep your eyes you open, do. like, or else you miss the really wonderful parts. You do, absolutely. Well, Craig, thank you so much for answering our questions and for writing these books. Oh, you thank better you. keep at it. I am very impatiently waiting next month <laughs> for the release of. Thanks for the last year. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you once again for this, this absolutely marvelous, marvelous exhibit. This has just been wonderful and a, a grand thing to have here in Buffalo for a full year. Just how wonderful it is. Well, we're, we're hoping that we can keep it up even longer. <laughs> and, um, kudos have to go to the museum staff and volunteers because, as you would figure, this is not a one-person show and the museum would not exist if it wasn't for this no. pretty amazing community we have yep. here. Absolutely.
Thank you, Sue. Thank you. Hi, my name is Craig Johnson. I'm the author of the Walt Longmire series. Look at, and uh, right now we are taking a tour um, through the Jim Gatchell Museum. Look at, and the wonderful exhibit that they've had um, up for, I guess, a little over a year um, with Walt Longmire. Look at, and uh, it's it, one of, first of all, I get the Jim Gatchell is one of my absolute favorite museums in the world. Look at, but uh, for numerous reasons, one of them being that. Um, this old Carnegie Library that houses the Jim Gatchell Museum is actually Walt Longmire's office. And if you can't see me in the reflection, that's me right there. Mm -hmm. And let's see, there's our publishing timeline, our television timeline, uh, a coaster that was actually from the first book, uh, Wyoming, which was the first state read for the state of Wyoming, which was uh, the book, The Spirit of Steamboat, which was the first novella uh, that I wrote. Um, this is the <laughs> this is the actual sign that was on Walt Longmire's desk in the TV show. Um, these are some languages that the books have been translated into, close to 20 languages, I guess. Um, this is, uh, let's see, it's the cover from any other name, and uh, that one hit at number six on the New York Times bestsellers list, and we've continued to go up, which is always nice. Uh, let's see, this is some of our artifacts that we have. This is actually Virgil's staff from um, Hell is Empty. Get a full length of it there. Coming down. That is actually Max. That was the dog that I got from the Sheridan Pound um, who lived with me when I was building the ranch out in Ucross myself, stacking those logs and pouring the concrete and everything. I, uh, I decided I needed some companionship and by golly, he became it. And he was absolutely magnificent. He was an absolutely wonderful dog. And he was one of those dogs that understood every single word you were saying. And uh, he was attached to me uh, for the entirety of his life and took a big chunk of my heart with him um, when he went. Um, this is uh, actually the, um, uh, the Colt 45 like it, that... Uh, is uh, the one that Walt carries. Like it's not the one that they use in the television show, like that. But uh, I knew that Walt was probably going to carry a Colt 45, you know, 1911. And um, whenever I started having him uh, carry that, you know, one of the things I decided was, is I thought, you know, it probably should have a little bit more of a Western kind of feel to it. And so I was fortunate enough that my good friend Richard Rhodes um, made some stag handles for me uh, to put on it and uh, I'm pretty happy with that. Um, this is a marvelous knife sheath. That is Henry's knife. Um, this was made for me by my good friend, Marcus Red Thunder, and uh, given to me like that. And uh, it, uh, it's, it's kind of lethal looking, like if you pull it out, like that you can get a feeling for it. Um, going on ahead down, you can see this is actually, let's say a bottle of Wyoming whiskey, small batch bourbon. It's a special edition, Longmire edition. And, uh, we uh, auctioned a big bunch of those off, you know, for the charities like that for um, our Longmire days. Like that, let's see, this is one of the patches from the television show and a campaign button, you know, for Walt Longmire when he first came out. Like that, and that's Walt's thermos there, the drinking fuel thermos, um, which I believe they're doing a facsimile of for the auction um, to be uh, sold. And let's see, this is the original Greg Manchez um, uh, painting for the original uh, paperback of the cold dish, um, which is pretty wonderful. Like that, and that used to well, it, it did hang in our kitchen, and hopefully, we'll go back to our kitchen someday um, whenever the, the, the gadget gets through with it, like that. But we're happy to have them borrowing it. Um, this is actually a Rocky Hawkins painting called The Old Ones. Like that, this is also from out at our house. Uh, it's uh, kind of, you know, the old Cheyenne, um, in my opinion, like that. They, they, they speak to me um, when the lights go down and it's dark. Um, this is actually my old royal uh, typewriter uh, that I used to start my career with. Um, they did have electric typewriters when I started out like that, but I just didn't have enough money to buy one. Um, this is the original manuscript um, for the cold dish. Um, it's, uh, I'm not going to tell you how many pages it is. It's a lot more pages than the one that got, uh, got actually printed. Look at, um, and these are the books. These are all the books, 
uh, let's see, up through Depth of Winter. You know, so uh, let's see, Land of Wolves is not there, and uh, the upcoming uh, Next to Last Stand is not there either. Like that, but uh, it will be, hopefully, at some point in time. Uh, one point of excitement here, I was actually the Rainier Beer Man of the Year in 2018. I knew that drinking all that beer would finally, you know, add to something. I thought it would probably be cirrhosis of the liver, but as it turns out, um, I got an award like that. Um, speaking of awards, this is a uh, marvelous uh, film uh, that was made um, by Bella Monticelli, like a, and uh, it actually was for Toomey, uh, the luggage company, and it was a competition uh, with Tribeca uh, to uh, do a commercial, like a, a lengthy branded commercial um, for Toomey. And uh, it, it's got a theater of the absurd because here is this this cowboy, you know, out with a pack saddle, you know, heading up the mountains like that with this very modern looking um, suitcase like that. But the suitcase certainly does pop like that. And I do my own stunts, just so you know. Um, those are, you know, my ponies like that. And uh, I got to admit that uh, the one that's got the, you know, the uh, pack saddle on him hasn't forgiven me yet like that. But uh, anyway, uh, it actually won the Tribeca uh, Award like that, which was really kind of wonderful like that. And, Kind of a, a credit to our, our director, Bella, who did a fantastic job. Um, this is a still from uh, the, the show Longmire. Uh, and, uh, and also the, some of the stills, like a production stills that we had um, for when we were on uh, A&E and then also uh, when we moved to Netflix. Um, a Santa Fe Inn magazine, like it with Katie Sackoff and Robert Taylor on the front cover. Um, there's also the Emmy... Uh, packet that went out from A&E for the first season of Longmire right there. And then one of my favorite items, of course, is the Walt Longmire bobblehead, which, uh, you know, I, I had to give to Robert Taylor once. As a matter of fact, I had to give Robert Taylor's mother one of them, too. Like that. That's an ARC, an advanced reader copy for uh, Land of Wolves. Um, that is the original hat that was made for Walt Longmire. And uh, let's see, Cowboys and Indians magazine. Had us on the cover. Look at it for one. There are some scripts uh, from Longmire. Um, let's see. One of the posters, look at that was uh, used for the show uh, in production, like that, and out there in Hollywood. Look at some stills also, you know, from Longmire days, which has been going on now for mm, coming up on 10 years. Look at We're all pretty excited about that. Like that. And uh, the final entry, look at in the exhibit, um, is right over here. And um, I, I, I have a little special spot in my heart for this one. Um, it's actually a facsimile of Walt's door. Um, and it's also an opportunity for Ruby uh, to, uh, for everybody to, to kind of do what Ruby does, which is like to leave Walt Longmire um, some post-it notes like that. And um, actually what's happened is an awful lot of people have left me notes. And the staff here at uh, the Jim Gatchel has been kind enough to collect all of those uh, wonderful, wonderful post-its, you know, from all the marvelous readers and visitors, like at and viewers that have come through Buffalo, like that, and make a, a notebook for me with all those post-its in it. And so, if I ever get to the point where I'm feeling kind of down, like that, and I need a little pick-me-up, I think what I will do is just break that book out and start reading, like that, because. Uh, how can anything like that make you feel any better, huh?